So let's talk about Pong for as long as humanly possible before it becomes unnatural. Uh, originally conceived by Nolan Bushwell in 1972, Pong was an instant classic in the bar that it was installed in and hit homes in 1975, becoming an immediate classic. So why are we talking about it today in 2020? Well, although it wasn't the first video game ever created and although it's not the most impressive, it is very important in the basic ideas of gameplay mechanics. And although Pong may seem a little bit barbaric in terms of its gameplay mechanics, and it is, there are actually some really interesting design mechanics that were made that make it worth talking about, even today. Um, as far as mechanics goes, it really is quite simple. It's, it's very similar to table tennis, um, so there might not have been a lot of decision making, but there was decision making nonetheless. It wasn't as simple as writing every single idea down and implementing everything. There had to be some design choices. For example, if you notice, the paddles can only go up and down. They can't go left to right. They can't move around. Now, if you've ever seen footage of the Magnavox Odyssey version of Ping Pong, which actually came before Nolan Bushwell's Pong, you'll notice that the paddles can actually move across the screen. And a reason that Nolan Bushwell might have potentially decided against this was because it made things too complicated. Pong was an instant success in the local bar that it was installed in, probably because of how simple it is. Really, all you have is two controls. You can move up and you can move down, and that's it. You have to learn two things, and you can learn two things pretty quickly. When you bring in moving from side to side or moving wherever you want your piece to move, especially with limited technology and no real easy way to move it around compared to today's standards, it might make things too complicated. So as Dustin Hansen points out in his novel Game On, perhaps the most impressive thing about Pong was its simplicity. And that was one of the main reasons that it gained so much popularity so quickly and so easily. People were able to figure it out within seconds and immediately they were having an experience they had never ever had in any capacity before. Like I said, this isn't the first video game, but it really was the first successful one. Earlier ones were much more difficult to control, really only played by uh, computer scientists. This was really the first video game to hit the public and be easily accessible by everybody. So let's talk about Pong in its gameplay mechanics. And we'll pull from Robert Zubek's novel Elements of Game Design to talk about things. So let's think about gameplay mechanics as pieces, actions, and rules. And that's pretty simple for Pong. As far as the pieces go, you have the two paddles for each player, and you've got the ball that you're knocking around. You've got the actions, which is moving up and down and hitting the ball to the other side or failing to. And then you've got the rules, and the rules are, if you hit the ball, it goes to the other side. If you don't hit the ball, your opponent gets a point. In the original version of Pong, it was 211, but in this version of Pong that I am playing, uh, I play 221 with the computer or with my opponent. Now, as I previously mentioned, one of the rules of the game is that you can only move up and down, you cannot move left and right. Um, and like I said before, that makes things really simple and really easy to pick up. Um, but it can also be a hindrance, because if you miss, you have no ability to recuperate. You just miss. Now, perhaps the simplicity of Pong, in some respects, ended up being a little bit of a detriment. Because, although the game is fun, there's not much to it. You figure it out within 30 seconds, and although at the time there was nothing really quite like it, especially in the home, surely you're going to get bored of it pretty quickly. Now, fortunately, I do not have the 1975 version of Pong. I have the 1977 version of Pong that was named Video Olympics. And what this 1977 version had two years after its original version was various formats, various versions of Pong that you can cycle through, each with different stages and different rules. So, by going to my Atari flashback, here and clicking the select button, I can scroll through all the various 
conversions. Now, I'm not sure if this is quite accurate to the 1977 version, but the version that I have has 50 different stages, each with different rules. Now, let's see, let's go to, oh, I don't know, uh, 23. Sure, 23 looks interesting. So it looks like version 23 of Pong on Video Olympics has just me. Uh, but what's interesting is that I'm basically playing wall ball. I'm interacting with the wall, which is acting as the sort of other paddle that's trying to knock the ball into my more clear goal here. So very similar rules to Pong, but a fresh take on it. And as I mentioned before, there are 50 different variations. And just two years after the original Pong, this is a lot of variation. So I think Pong is an excellent example of why gameplay mechanics and the decisions behind those mechanics are so important. It's very likely that the decisions behind Pong and its various forms are the reasons why it was so successful. It's simplicity, but it's complexity at the same time. It's replayability because of how simple it is and as a two-player game can really be endless fun. It's probably why it was more successful than the Magnavox Odyssey version of Ping Pong. It was more simple. It was more well thought out as a game. I think Pong is an excellent place to start the discussion of game design and gameplay mechanics because Nolan Bushwell has proven that even though he was one of the pioneers of game design and was one of the first to bring games to the household, he still had to make as important of decisions as the developers of, let's say, Halo or Call of Duty or anything like that. Nolan Bushwell has proven that since day one, they have had to think of these as games, games for people to play, games for people to enjoy. They had to make decisions that would make the gameplay easy and also challenging. But most importantly, it had to be fun. And Nolan Bushwell was clearly successful in that. So does Tetris hold up to today's standards of graphics and games? No, absolutely not. Not even remotely close. And it wasn't supposed to. But that doesn't affect its importance in the history of video games and video game design. Pong deserves its place in video game history, without a doubt. There was a lot of thought and hard work put into it, and it was successful for those reasons, and it deserves to be that way. Now do yourself a favor and go grab Pong and play it for a solid two minutes, and thank yourself you didn't play it for any longer. I am in my garage, I am hot, I am sweaty, and I don't ever need to touch Pong again.